good evening, how you doing? Thank you for coming out, peace, what's up, hello. In respect and deference to, uh, to the new shit show, I'm gonna do some new shit. Um, there you go. Nigger lover. Exactly. <laughs> And now we know why I've never really read this one. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my house with that shit, man. It is Sunday morning, and the only people talking about love are crazy. This one woman, a tuxedoed buzzard in a plastic bag fedora and dirty sock tamale, stands in the doorway of the coffee shop, her blues song chirp rising high as the sun. I'm not a nigga, I'm a nigga lover. Her voice gunshots in black in a black hole along streets already swept to sterility, but no one hears her. People, as they pass, shield their daisy-haired children from the arterial spray of her words, fearing crazy might spin from her mouth and catch root grow wild. The woman couldn't care less, takes off her shoes and shouts into the mailbox, I'm not a nigga, I'm a nigga lover. Just then, a white woman approaches her, handing her a pastry in a white bag, as if kindness might be the cure, hoping to soften her mouth with sugar. But doesn't she just turn to her, her eyes glistening like raccoon eyes in flashlight, and says, Bitch, I'm not a nigga, I'm a nigga lover. And the white woman smooths the wrinkles in her skirt with her palms, says, Well, I have to go now. You take care. And the woman snatches up her shoes, her socks, her recycle earth grocery purse, and marches away from the coffee shop. Words spilling from her mouth, free and loose now, like tears at a funeral over a person having died for nothing. Where are you? Where are you? The Londres de Musica. The Londres de Musica what? <laughs> 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 alright, alright. Other changes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Kill it. <laughs> this I did read. <laughs> Um, uh, there you go. And my mom would probably appreciate me read something else, but I really like this. <laughs> this is a pneumonia or cognac for water. Her voice tattered as a blues musician who drank cognac for water. Weeks before tonight, before the prayers, before the flowers and dark car even. I stood over Mama watching her choke on the plastic air tube the ER docs funneled into her throat. I stood above her, just us in the hallway, my hands dumb and useless. What did she see in my eyes? Happiness. I was happy this is helping, right? Right? But that was then. Now, in a corroded voice, she sits up in bed, tells everything she overheard the graveyard nurses do during the late shift last night. Boy, what she could get for five dollars in a medical supply closet. Hermaphrodites, horny orderlies, hot love affairs. These freaks love helping the sick, but they're sick too, Mama says. 
worse than the drug addict she used to teach at the beauty school. And right then, Mama's old friend Teresa walks into the hospital room, sits at her bedside, quietly takes out her eyes and polishes them with the napkin she holds tight as a microphone wired to heaven. Mama says, talking over Teresa's tears now, speaking of the man who buried so many of our relatives, Tell Thompson, get ready for another funeral. Teresa says, oh, Miss Cagney, stop it. I say nothing. I look out at the sky, beaten purple black from the storm, strobe lightning. God is too busy playing paparazzi for any prayers tonight. I'd forgotten how Mama had been so frightened of thunder. God is talking, she used to say. Fill your mouth with prayers of forgiveness. But compared to this pneumonia, to a body coughing itself empty, to a husband's infidelity with death and his orgasm of earthworms, to useless me even, this, this is nothing. Nothing, do you hear? Teresa and her pity having long since gone. Now it's just us and God voguing in the background. <laughs> now, Mama says, where was I at? Oh yes, them hermaphrodite nurses, them bad boys, they got working here at night. Let me tell you what happened. Oh God, how we laughed. My second go round uh, with this, I read this at the uh, Golden Gate Slam. Um, Blood Strangers. I never told you about the summer I kept a regular correspondence with my mother. My mother, yet not my mother. After she moved to Louisiana. This was a year or more after we'd first met. I was 20. In one letter, I wrote her about a dream. In it, my sister Avis, my true sister, mailed me an envelope I opened over a coffee table and photographs swam out like fish. This dream was triggered after seeing a young man on the bus one night. Avis's male twin down to the galaxy of freckles scattered across his nose. I wondered if we were related. I wanted to say something or stare at him and could do neither. It was dark with rain like angry bird wings and I pretended to watch the water fanning beneath the moving bus but instead looked at his reflection, looked at my sister, looked at me. It was then I realized there exists a contingent of people in the world who all look alike and belong together. This is called family, but I didn't know that. In my family, I favored no one. And for us, that was normal. I wrote this to my mother, who was my mother, yet not my mother. And in reply, she mailed me a real envelope fat with unnarrated pictures of all my blood strangers. They were people I didn't know, yet all variations of me, as if they were practice sketches before the creator settled on mine. Thank you. I never told you that my mother, who was not my mother, yet was my mother, was custodian of family photos, rare cells of aunts, uncles in their black and white lives. At my mother's funeral, the house buzzed with relatives who stuffed their purses and pockets with photographs until, while waving in the driveway, genealogical collages autumned from their coattails. My aunt, 
promoted curator harvested photographs from the lawn like weeds. The family let go. My mother, not my mother, and my father, not my father, claimed responsibility. Without them, no one owed me anything, not even love. I never told you about the time I grabbed my brother, not my brother, after work one Friday. That morning, I rolled a blunt for breakfast, hid it in the office, then asked him to join me for a four o'clock potluck. He bought a bottle of Hennessy from the liquor store across from the hotel. We sat at the pier exchanging the sacred texts of our lives. We finished drinking, smoking, and stumbled back to his house. Once home, he turned to his mother, young and healthy and not my mother, and mentioned a story he had told me about his uncle. She corrected him. That wasn't Uncle Blank. That was Uncle Blank, back when we lived on Blank. And they stood in the kitchen like that, exchanging names like playing speed. Then she picked up the sacred book, opened it, and began turning pages, apologizing. I hope this isn't too much, she said. You're probably sick of hearing about all these people you don't know, she said, but she couldn't stop. I didn't want her to stop. They got church loud, reenacting scenes from their memories. Some photos they hollered, sanctified. Some faces appear and the page quietly turned. Last part. I never told you about my girlfriend, no longer my girlfriend. And when I first met her family, her mother stared me down and called the name of her own brother, whom she said I resembled. I did. I walked the corridor of her house and saw him, his face a remix of mine. I stared at his photograph like looking at my own, but in a dream where details are soft and malleable. He stood with his half dozen siblings folded like wings around seated elders. This photograph was crowned with a gallery of my girl, no longer my girl, and her family, all in various stages of happy youth. Sometimes, in the dim morning light of our room, I could almost see the chain of ingredients of her family in her sleeping face. She has a family. I didn't know what I had. A life that felt like someone else's. Through her, I've learned feelings are transient and impatient. Even now, it seems she was holding me for someone else, holding me to give me away. In her arms, I was floating debris, unmoored, and this is why she sailed away on an ocean of tears. She knows belonging, love, what am I, but a story taken down annually off the shelf and passed around like a bottle. Do you remember the time? Can you remember his name? Then quietly turn the page. So I don't have to mug you on the bark on the way on the back to the Looking out for you to look out for me. Chiclac. All right, all right. Don't give me. Where Cotton is mother. The promised land is quarantined. Double plurals are discontinued and our melodies hated. Religious and destitute orphans fitted for coffins then cloned to the capillaries learn the slavery of slow finish in the metaphysics of the ghetto. Who will govern in our year of sleep? Who translates these scriptures of fire? Who will prevent this orchestra from diluting our emotions? 
Hear how we walk among decibels remembered. And tend something gray during the fireworks of flowers. Rule your living room with an iron yawn. Except when apartments behave like nuns praying amongst flames. Study the radiant entomology of inconsistent skin. Hammock it richly. It's how we consume what's most important. While the vocalist sings her scars loose, the senator arrives by email. In your mind, he says, there is a question about the color yellow. In this rainforest of cotton lit by Christmas light fireflies, we write letters to the dead on peeled onion skin. In your seawater room, there are sunken alphabets and languages unaccounted for. In the ecology of the warehouse, there is a metric ton of unclaimed dreams spinning and bleeding convex light everywhere at once. want to do uh, this. I've been I'm trying to uh, collect and do more dream poems, and this is just somehow a really specific dream, and I just want to run it for you. It's called Reflecting Mirrors of Hate. Bus lines have problematic roots. The one I'm on enters the lock of an abandoned factory through the narrow tear in a cyclone fence. The bus drives off the edge of a five-foot concrete embankment and stops. We climb outside, and while pointing to the, scar to the parked bus and scarred wall, I scream at the driver, why are we doing this? Angry. I leave the tour, strolling through nearby financial district buildings. I am surrounded by mourners and their attorneys standing in line at taco trucks. I return to my house where I'm late for a party. My best friend is playing my role in the family, and no one has noticed a difference. In fact, he bonded with relatives I haven't met. Plus, he's discovered the family secret. Want me to show you who hates you the most, he says, then stares at me, because we both know who it is. Uniformed schoolgirls pass our porch, mean mugging us, selling us dolls, badges, melted candy like thugs would do a drive-by. The streets shadow with clouds, brick walls grow wild from the ground. My relatives and the friend playing me share a secret handshake. Then he turns to me, says, I should have packed that bike for you. Can you ride? They say you never forget. He says, I mean a motorcycle. And the town, the brick wall, the gang of schoolgirls, everything falls away into farmland, endless fields growing nothing. My friend stands on the porch of the only house here, watching me straddle a motorcycle parked at the steps. I start the motor. Beneath me, hot kernels of brown sugar earth pop. Tall grasses bow and blacken. Want to know who hates you more than yourself, he asked from the doorway. Nobody. I ride, throttle up so fast my chest collapses. The horizon, the vacant acres, dissolve to rough lines how a cartoonist might sketch a tornado or thoughts in confusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, like one or two more? Um, what's my time? I actually premiered this when I was last here, and after reading it, I did another pass, and I really like this version now. This is a hot box of darkness. Yeah. A garbage bag of green bud yawned open next to him, a final orchid photosynthesizing the light from the TV. 
He'd grab fistfuls of weed the size of jawbreakers and drop them into the food processor, begging at his feet. It's for my birthday, he said, as the harvest tumbled to flower. The night of the party, I saw him, winter dreadlocks avalanching past his narrow shoulders, a lacquered baobab branch for a walking stick. Girls his granddaughter's age carried him upstairs to the vortex of the VIP lounge, where, over the strobe lightning strikes of flash photos, he lets out a war cry as prescription. Get you some cake! <laughs> we do. <laughs> Chunks of pound cake with flakes of green like poppy seeds and volcanic mounds of chicken wings battered and fried in hemp oil. As we eat, our tongues fall asleep in our mouths. <laughs> Tonight, the sidewalks are soft as bread, and we alternate sips of alcohol with night air smuggled through the cracked windows of the club. At each table, there is a hand-carved box of Eucharist spliffs. We take one and confess to our Egyptian waitress with Vicanus Majoris hips, shrink-wrapped in, in stretched denim. She eclipses all conversation, every thought, with a moonlight smile floating through our table cityscape of bottles and shot glasses emulsified in Hennessy and beer foam. Squinting through the fog banks of sage, we can clearly see what time it is. Oh, how tight we hold one another while only half awake in God's presence. This is uh, this is where I'm gonna stop. Uh, thank you guys for um, for coming out. Today. Um, so technically, I've I've read this poem correctly only really once before because I realized as I initially read it when I first wrote it, I was fucking up. And I was like, by rights, because it's a persona poem, um, it should be written as it was intended. So I'm going to try to do that, hopefully not make too much of a fool of myself. But um, the poem is called Monologue for a Drunk Chicken. <laughs> Your gig is to imagine a chicken. And my part... It's to be the chicken. To be the chicken. Yeah. It's to see uh, if I yeah if I could read this as if I was drunk. <laughs> My love <laughs> for a drunk chicken. Just drunk and I'll tell you another thing. <laughs> Everything you know is a lie, and all your efforts have been wasted. I got more sense than you when I'm asleep. <laughs> Than you can, and I have only the suggestion of a tongue. <laughs> you can learn something from me, boy, down at the crawdad hole, in the shade of that walnut tree, or just standing erect in the yard, living this close to the dirt. I got no reason to lie. <laughs> What's your excuse? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all your problems come from sugar. I know it. I don't even pet that shit. <laughs> My weakness is for the berries on these bushes. I eat them and cannot stop. 
the sweet sludge crawls within me. I become drunk like you turn on a light. <laughs> now. <laughs> What was I talking about? <laughs> oh yeah, fool, the words you use in your coop don't make sense to me. You call me dumb because I don't feel nothing except hunger and my brain is the size of a dime. Well, fuck you and kiss my chicken ass. <laughs> in God. I believe in love. But you, you pray and you're still unhappy. Your God is a punk. My God is made of fire and I praise him when I feel his approach. I know it's him because everything changes. Everything gets bright and shiny and warm. And I sing to him and my voice pours easy from my throat. He approaches and tosses down heat like grain. What does he give you except reasons to cry? Mm. Mm -hmm. You're a sad, sad case. You don't know me, and you don't know love. Look at yourself. <laughs> Look at yourself in a palm full of well water, and you'll see floating among your fingers what real chicken shit is. Thank you.